Andrew and I, we founded the Woodland League, God, 22 years ago, with uh, three oars. Restoration of the relationship between the Irish people and their native trees to build sane communities and support mental health, which is dwindling. Two, reform of the forest. Britain, in 1906, the imperial government granted to Ireland forestry autonomy, forestry independence, on condition that we followed a um, plantation model. We've never broken that model. We don't know how. We're stuck to the straight lines of the white man's thinking. Soft wood North American trees that don't grow or build good houses. They grow too fast. It's too damp and warm on this island. And third, regeneration of Ireland's native forest. Three oars. So, Andrew St. Ledger, he was always emphatic that there's no D in his ledger. L-E-G-E-R. And he was a furniture maker of an exquisite frequency of furniture. He was uh, president of the Irish Wood Turners Guild, of the All Ireland Wood Turners Guild. From a very, very young age, he could turn wood and make exquisite objects. He was most proud as an introvert when I met him. He was very internal and I'm very external. So it worked. I didn't bore him and he didn't scare me. <laughs> I just say it sort of worked. We bounced well and we found a way that we could work together and create the Woodland League and found a limited company and that was 25, 26 years ago he turned up on my doorstep. I didn't know him. And um, he, he found his voice. He was able to speak at major functions. He got to know the late Oliver Ratton quite well. Oliver himself got quite on quite well. He moved to Africa for quite a while to teach and learn new wood turning skills among indigenous peoples. And then he moved to South America to a number of areas in the Amazon to teach and learn new wood turning skills and brought them back to Ireland and learnt of new wood, new timbers. But he was he he passed over at fifty seven, just last October the twenty eighth. Apparently, I hear from his four beautiful sisters, the Saint Ledger sisters, that he passed over in his log cabin in the remote mountains. But Andrew's time it was time to go. He lived a good life. By good I mean decent, by good I mean purposeful, by good I mean humble but loud. He found his voice, this introvert who had not great eye and verbal contact was now speaking at major conventions on mental health associated with the native forest and he spoke with authority and with knowledge and he was loved. So I want to remember Andrew and the chance he gave me, the opportunity he gave me to mentor him and, and show him the initial ropes. I knew nothing about making wood. I know about growing trees. He knows about turning a tree into the most gorgeous piece of timber you ever saw. Well, Andrew, 
was always in touch with the indigenous peoples of various countries, but he made great contact with the men, men enemy. I can't pronounce the words, but um, they are uh, they're an Aboriginal people, and they arrived here in August. And they gave talks in County Clare and they travelled around the country with Andrew and they spoke to communities. And on their last day before flying back, they visited me here. And I had a very special day with Andrew. And with these really beautiful women. Quiet, composed, very most gracious women very alert, very sensitised, because they said as soon, they said to me, as soon as they landed at Shannon, they felt the, what they called the historic trauma. They felt the deep grief in the people. Damaged, they, was the word they used, damaged people and they looked around and over, as the days passed they realised we were planting Alaskan softwood conifers. We were planting, planting Sitka spruce and all sorts of exotic North American conifers. And it took a while for Andrew to find where the pockets of native woodland are up in County Clare in the Schlieve-Octi Mountains. Uh, Chevy Chase, Car Murphy, Castle Taylor, Raheen Woods near Tomb Grainy. But these are only small pockets. They're, they're not, there's no large woodland. You couldn't bring wolves back to Ireland. There's, it's too fragmented an ecosystem. It's too damaged. And they spoke about that. And they spoke about that their own indigenous people in America, they're still, generations later, still going through the trauma of not so much colonisation, but extermination, and having survived. And they were emphatic that native languages come from the forest, they also said. And that's why they had read a lot about the Irish language and saw it was dying on its feet. Uh, Andrew brought them to some of the the, the true Gwaeltoks and there wasn't an oak to, to be found. It was all Sitka spruce all through the Gwaeltoks of the west of Ireland. Coulee, there isn't an oak to be found. It's all coniferized. Balangiri, there is some scrub and regeneration. That won't last. That'll be cleared for Sitka spruce. It's all Sitka spruce. It's all commercial plantation that's not forestry it's plantation big difference and their message from these Mananami, Mananami people these good people get the forest right if you want to rebuild the psychic energies and tune into the ancestral energies and find your place again a heart without grief remains hollow. So there's something in grief that builds, builds us. I'm here in the castle grounds in Macroom, leaning up against the oldest oak tree in Mosgrey. It's still surviving. I'm looking over the golf club. I was time con kind le Ted Cook. It's an amazing, huge, gnarly ancient oak head a maiden unplanted and respected by the hedges and respected by the various generations of planters because in 
several old estates, Burr Castle. The Parsons, when they were granted Burr, right in front of Burr Castle is the ancient inauguration oak of the O'Carrolls of the late 14th century. Still standing, never touched and respected by the new planters. Ah. It wasn't trophyism. Trophyism? I believe a trophy of the old Celtic order. No, it was a respect. Many of the families were refined and respectful. Not all of them were Cromwellian and wicked. And I feel that this tree, I feel that this particular, known as the McCarthy or the Mus I've heard it called the Muscree Oak, uh, this, this was not disturbed by the new planters after the Prince of Orange took Ireland in 1690. And a new wave of planters came in to the estates. Now, the 17th Lord Musgrave joined Charles II in Brussels after Cromwell took over in England. The loyal, royalist Irish aristocracy the anti-Commonwealth, the anti-Republic, the anti-Cromwellian Irish aristocracy remained loyal to the Crown. On the promise of the return and the restoration of your estates, the seizing back from the Cromwellian planters and the regranting to Catholic or Protestant, anyone aristocratic loyal to the Crown get their estates back. And in fairness, Charles II, the son of Charles I, when he came back to the throne by, by 1658, 1660, he did return a number of estates. Despite the oath, which we heard Charles III recently utter on his accession to the throne, the upholding forever of the Protestant religion. And Charles was warned, you won't get your throne back unless you absolutely return no land to the Catholic aristocracy. But Charles was in a bind. He had the Irish loyal aristocracy with him in Brussels during the Commonwealth. They ran a, an exiled government of England and Ireland from the Commonwealth. So Muscree got his estates back. Penn had been granted this domain by Cromwell personally. Admiral Sir William Penn, Chief Admirable, Admiral of the Fleet of Cromwell. But he didn't like it here. And he went to America and he founded Pennsylvania, the great forest state of Penn, Sylvania. Um, was so, he a Quaker? His son was a Quaker. Oh, yeah. His son was a Quaker and went to prison many times for being a Quaker because the established church did not... They abhorred Quakerism or any form of dissent from acknowledging the crown as the vicar of Christ on earth. That was called the Act of Supremacy where the King of England is the head of the Church of Christ and not the Pope. And uh, so there was no room for any... any any voodoo or any any biodynamics or Jungian thinking or you just you just it was homogenization, which is what religions do to people. They homogenize them, homogenetic, to make the same gene, to beat the same concepts into them. In other words, there's a recent development in America which is very shocking. AI has defined this existence for all organisms, fish, flesh, or fowl. They're called the three Fs, and no more. We incarnate purely to flirt, feed, and flush. Zero. That is the current definition of this precious time we have been given in this atomic vessel. Three Fs and no more. AI said there is no more to the human. He flirts, he feeds and he flushes. 
That's 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 pretty scary. That's pretty scary. Is is that it? Is like is that it? But in any event, to go back to the inaugural trees, McCarthy came back to his castle. But in the meanwhile, Penn sold the domain to, to Judge Barnard of Bandon, Castle Barnard, who bought a lot of the muskery. So the 17th Lord, who came back with a new title, Lord Clancarty, Charles II elevated him to Lord Clancarty. Um, he came back as a tenant of, of Castle Barnard, of, of a tenant of Judge Barnard of Bandon, which was intolerable. That was 1660 he came back, paying a thousand guineas a year to Judge Barnard to get his estate back. That wasn't what the deal was with Charles II, but Charles II at this stage was emasculated. He had no power. His promises he had to break. Cromwell had left a dark shadow of deep fundamentalist Christianity behind him that now tainted Parliament in England and wouldn't have any Catholic on any land and already the penal laws were being devised I, I think as early as the mid-1600s. They weren't brought into force until 1702. But... Uh, the years went on, the oppression mounted again under Charles II. Then Charles II's brother, Charles II is an Anglican Protestant king. Charles II's brother, James II, is a Catholic with a Protestant wife. That was very, very widespread. It was very common. You had Henry VIII, a Catholic, till he declared himself the head of the church, and then he became an Anglican. His first daughter by Catherine of Aragon, Mary, she was a Catholic, and brought England and Ireland strictly back under Rome and began to persecute the, the Protestants. Her half-sister, Elizabeth, swung it back again to Anglican and began to persecute the Catholics. It came down to then James VI of Scotland, which was James I, and all the way back, uh, uh, Charles I, Charles II had a Catholic wife. His brother James II was a Catholic with a Protestant wife. Their daughter, a Protestant, their daughter, the Catholic King of England's daughter, married the Prince of Orange. Prince King Billy of Orange was mar James II was the father-in-law of King Billy. King Billy. And it was a battle between the son and the father-in-law that landed us at the Battle of the Boyne. It was a family, a massive family feud, and they decided they'd fight it out in Ireland. James failed, James lost, because of something very, very important. They were winning at Ockram. The Jacobites were winning at Ockram. The very gods were giving Ireland back to the rightful owners. And the leader of the French brigade, St. Ruth, was in front of the French and the French were ready to charge and break the back of, of the King Billy's people. And a stray cannon blew his head off and the French withdrew from the field. The French, thousands and thousands of crack troops withdrew now the Irish were pursued to Galway and then pursued by King William's forces to Limerick where we had the Treaty of Limerick. And the Treaty of Limerick promised freedom of religious practice. There was a Treaty of Limerick. Limerick is the city of the broken treaty. It is a profound event in the history of, of Europe. For me, the history of the world. I lived in the north during the loss of 3,000 lives. This goes back to the Treaty of Limerick because the Irish signed Lord Sarsfield, Patrick Sarsfield, Lord Lucan is his name, 
the agreement was the Irish forces would quit Ireland and never come back. The small print did not say that they couldn't take their wives and children. When it came to leave on the ships, piling up in all the ports to carry them to France, Poland, we have a record of 5,000 men going to join the King of Poland's army. It's reckoned 430,000 Irish men left after the Treaty of Limerick. The, keeping the promise. All men must leave and the people who's left will be given free human rights. They were only gone. They threw out... King, King William was honourable. They threw out King William's treaty and brought in the penal laws. No Catholic may own a land. No Catholic may learn to read or write unless instructed by a Protestant. No Catholic may be a barrister or a lawyer, be in any profession. On the death of the Catholic, his land, no matter what size, must be divided equally, equally among all his daughters and sons. So anyone with a tiny holding was brought down to half acre, bit by bit. No Catholic may own a horse worth more than five guineas. A Catholic is punishable by death for bearing arms in public. So we have, we have Art O'Leary, the story of Art O'Leary, refusing to sell his horse to Judge Morrison, and he was shot in the back. The shoot-to-kill policy begins in the 1730s. It's crystal clear what was going on. Any Catholic that dared ride a white steed in the armoury and heraldry of the, of the Empress uh, Marie Therese. He was a captain in the Austrian army and he came back with full honours. The new upstart, as I say, manufactured gentry couldn't handle anyone creating any archetype. There must be no archetype that gives any hope to the people. And... Um, and so, till, eight, till 1782, that's three generations, there was no recourse to law because Catholics had no access to law. They were outlawed. They were outside the common law. So it's a very, very problematic period. And this tree has seen that entire, all of those events. I uh, believe this tree saw Penn, saw the 17th, Muskery, probably saw the 14th Muskery and may likely have been. Why? Because I've been told before the knocking of the castle on the turret of the castle up the cut limestone stairwells these towers were very ancient. Both towers had spiral staircases and cut limestone from the top. This tree and on the way back, I'll prove it to you, when you're looking back in the parkland, this tree dominates the entire landscape of the hill. This suggests that this tree not only was seen from the castle, it was a dominant feature. In the meanwhile, it wouldn't be seen because of the plantings upriver, but this tree would have been an outstanding feature from McCroom Castle. It was central, as O'Carroll's oak is to the Lord Ross and the Parson family of Burr Castle. And there's another, a lot of instances, another, a lot, loads of other instances there where the incoming planting gentry maintains the woodlands. There was another propter decorum laid down in feudal law which survived right up, uh, right, survived right through the Cromwellian, Elizabethan Cromwellian and Williamite period. When you acquired an estate through forfeiture or failure of male line, failure of primogeniture, feudalism was based, you must have a son. If you don't, your title and land goes back to the crown for redistribution to a new loyalist who will provide males for his army. So very violent stuff. Feudalism was about, about confiscation and... But in any event... One of the propter decorum rules was when you came into the estate, granted freshly or inherited through bloodline, woodlands were never disturbed. It 
the rule of the Normans. And there's a recent research done, I've seen some PhD research, widespread research about the many, many hundreds. 31% of England is still in the same Norman families of 1066, incidentally. The research shows nowhere did a newcomer disturb existing woodland. That's important. That practice would have passed over to Ireland. It was in the psyche, it was in the English, British perhaps, British psyche, the value of woodlands to hunting, timber, firing to stay warm in your castle, but also much higher symbols. For example, what do I mean by symbols? I want to read you out three statements read to the Elizabethan court by three leading influencers of Elizabeth I. The first we hear of at the height of her reign during the plantation of Munster by Elizabeth. Bandon was the first plantation. Queen Mary the Catholic had planted Offaly and Leash and named them King and Queen's County. It wasn't a Protestant plantation, it was an English plantation to clear the O'Moores and the O'Carrolls out of Burr. But Elizabeth's plantation during the 1580s was to plant loyal Protestants throughout Munster. Bandon was the first settlement, going way back in the early reign of Elizabeth. But these are three examples of the influences in the court concerning what is to be done with the very, very vast virgin oak forests of our new colony of Ireland. What's to be done? Richard Speart, addressing Her Majesty in 1583, said the following. There is nothing more fitting, my lady, to bridle this idle race than the cutting down of their entire oak wood, which we now know is their chiefest source of strength, unquote. What does that mean? Is that about timber? Do you, do you hide in the forest? Or is it more to do with the spiritual strength of the Celtic races within the forest? Like today we are a forest people, but we've no forest. So we are ashamed. We know the story of, do you know the story of the king with the horse's ears? Do you know that, you know that story? Mm -hmm. Will I tell it? Do. It's very relevant. It tells us of a forest people. There's a king in the castle. What was his name? Lowrus. Lowrus of the, of the horse's ears. The, the king was living in the castle. He had horse's ears. No, anyone that saw them had to be executed. Twice a year, a barber would come to the castle and cut his ears, but the barber never emerged from the castle. And one day a knock, a knock on the door of a little widow's cabin in the forest. Her son was next on the list. Her, young, her only child, a young teenager. He was now being called by the local chieftain to be the barber. But the mother knew something was wrong. For no one ever comes back out of that house, that castle. And she went to the castle and said, I'll let my son cut the king's ears. Cut the king's hair. Cut the king's hair. Cut his royal, his, ro his highness's hair. But he must, I've no one else in the world. You must give me back my son. No one else is coming out of here every time they go in. And the guarantee is given on condition he reveals nothing what he sees or hears in the castle. The son goes in and cuts the king's ears and carries an unbelievable burden that their local king is a half horse. He's got horse's ears. But he has been free to leave the castle because of the guarantee, the assurance given to his mother, the widow. His mental health breaks down. He can't carry the burden. None of us are designed for that burden. He can't speak to anyone. 
You can't tell anyone. His mother sees him becoming suicidal and sends him into the forest and says, Son, the healing is in the woods. Go away with your child on your own and go away into the forest. Spend time in the forest. Share the burden with the trees. And he goes away into the forest and he's sitting on the river bank. And he turns to a big old willow, a huge big old sunny tree. And he tells the tree what he saw. And the burden is lifted. The burden is lifted. And he's free. The forest can take our pain guilt and shame that's what they're there for they're here they're here to evolve us they're here to bring us out of arched baboon into into high consciousness that's why they're here that's what they're if you're breathing thank a tree that's what they're that's what they're doing for us now the king is time for a new harp the, har the old harp is out of tune and he sends his woodmen into the forest to find... Now, as you know, the brine brew harp of Trinity College is made from willow wood. The ancient harps of Ireland were made from the willow. The sound box is willow. The pillar is usually alder, but the sound is the willow sound. And the woodmen come to this particular big, fat willow tree. And they say, Christ, there's our tree. We'll cut this tree down and we'll make a harp. And on the prelude, or re the first night of the new harp, the whole kingdom is gathered in the castle because it was very deep ritual for the first sounds of the harp. The new harp, the king's new harp, the symbol of sovereignty and so forth. The plucking of strings, more like it, but I still respect the harp but it is to do with pulling strings. We were too long subjugated under corrupt masters. We learned bad habits. We learned bakshi. Bakshish? Corrupt, cor the way of corruption? We learned this. In any event, the night is there, we're all gathered and the harp begins to play and as the strings are pulled, the harp begins to sing King Laurus, it can be clearly heard, King Laurus, our king, has horse's ears. The whispered secret into the timber played out in the musical instruments. That tells us of, of how deep the connection is with the forest. Many of our oldest stories are about the forest and about redemption through the forest. And that is where spirit is saying, cut the source of their chiefest strength. That's how you break the last of the forest peoples of Europe. Leave not one tree standing. Then it went on and George Long, this was a few years later, was asked to share his philosophy and thinking with her ladyship, Queen Elizabeth. And he is recorded in the annals as saying, Queen, to preserve the woods in England, let us usefully waste those Irish woods once and for all. Okay? There's now the commercial. The first one is more of a spiritual thing. How to emasculate or castrate a culture. As these Timorese had the last of their sandalwood forests cut down and removed uh, in, the, in the Dutch period. That was their forest history, that was their culture, that was their... To use a, an Irish poet, a very early Irish poet, one of the O'Neill poets of Tyrone, Farflaha O'Ganeve was his name, Farflaha O'Ganeve. And the translation of the first verse, Wild wood, nurse of my youth, Without you, 
we are exiles in Aaron, forever Irish, will be strangers at home without the wild wood. Look at the state of our people. Think and reflect and look at what's happening. Our divine Aaron. There's not a yew tree, there's nothing left. It's all sick of spruce. Now, then Lord Deputy Russell was appointed as the Viceroy to Dublin Castle. And in 1594, he went back to England. And this time the Queen acted. He said the argument about removing these millions and millions of cubic metres of oak and yew. Remember, in 1249, 20 years before the Norman invasion under, under Henry II, into Carinsore Point in Wexford, a Dominican monk by the name of Cambrensis, Geraldus Cambrensis, a, a Fitzgerald, a Norman Fitz, Fitz French son of, was sent to Ireland to make a list of the bounty. What is in this island? Name the rivers, is there salmon, where are the deer? Describe the forests. And he goes back to Henry II and he describes, there are more you pure you forests, bigger than any oak in England, each you, than anywhere I've seen in, in Western Europe, in his travels as a, as a monk. Now that really lured Henry. Henry, Christ, the rivers are full of salmon. And, the, and, and remember, the yeomanry, the yeomanry, the yeomanry, the longbowmen, why did they cut those two fingers? Why did the French capture the long bowmen of England? Remember, bows and yews were only made of yew. Out of yew, you'd no bow, no arrow. Why did the French always trap, cut off the fingers of both hands and then release the English back behind their own lions? What do you need these two fingers for? The Ireland has so much yew. You could give a bow to everyone in England. And remember the long bowmen, they could pierce iron mail. They could pierce Norman mail. So that was very, very attractive and would have lured Henry to even more so want and court and finally, against his mother's wishes, to leave Ireland alone, a spiritual homeland. This would have been the Tibet of the Europe of the 1200s. Skellig Michael, the rock of the Archangel Michael, predates and was replicated by Mont Saint Michel, a great monastery on the rock out at sea in Normandy, inspired by a much more ancient. Saint Michael didn't just belong to the Normans, he was, he was deeply revered by the by ascetic the ascetic church the ascetics the esoteric people not the people who want books the people who know how to go within who had techniques of going within that's esoteric in greek to go within modern religion is exoteric a theater of respectability are you seen or not seen but the uh, the ascetic church the ascetic church the the real church, the real message of the master, the kingdom you're looking for is inside of you. It's not out there in finery and theatre. So the Lord Deputy Russell made the following statement to the Queen. Annually, my lady, 3,000 tonnes of English oak are used to barrel Irish herrings. Let us make our barrels out of Irish oak and clear the forests once and for all. That's the beginning of the end of the forest. Now, I'm not saying the Elizabethans cleared the forest. They took maybe much of what was left. Cromwell offered ten shillings for every dead wolf when he was in Ireland. Because he, 
a lot of his soldiers having been, I remember said earlier, fed on the promises of estates, illiterate men from the mountains of Wales and England, but who had become obsessed with this new biblical interpretation of, of scripture, Calvinistic. They wouldn't settle in Ireland. The country was full of wolves. So Cromwell first had to get rid of the wolves to be able to pay his soldiers with, with bundles of acres. So, uh, 10 shillings a wolf. Now, you have to understand the habitat of the wolf. The wolf habitat is deep forest. Very deep forest. Those impenetrable parts of the forest that man had never subjugated. Reminding me of Carl Jung, the great psychoanalyst, one of his last statements. The human is in the late morning of his evolution. Perhaps by lunchtime he will have dropped his dream of dominion and just in time, just in time, become a little more natural. We're obsessed with dominion over each other. It's where shame and guilt starts coming in. There's ways of how we destroy each other. Very, very subtle ways. It's from ego. Not from 18 inches away, not from the heart, not from the pure spirit, but from this manufactured, this, this computer, not radio. The radio is, we, 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 we are feeling machines working through frequencies, but this has no frequency, it just has concepts. So they were the three primary advices to, to Elizabeth. As I say, I don't, it would be wrong to think that uh, the Elizabethans destroyed the Irish psyche by cutting the forest. Remember Samson's hair. The warning was, if Samson's hair is cut short and kept short, the Old Testament, his strength will never rise. There's a similar analogy or metaphor. Keep the oaks down or enwall the oak woods and keep the Irish out and keep their strength down. But if they get their hands on the knowledge of oak and the knowledge of the salmon, if they get their hands on the ancient knowledge of the earth, they'll grow again. And we don't want that. We want dominion is our, is our signature. We dominate each other, which is a great pity. Um, so I would say a lot of the woodlands were cut by the Celts, the Iron Age Celts, 800 to 300 BC, the Iron Age peoples were coming in with iron, iron ploughs, iron axes. The Bronze Age was over. You can plough out this tree with an iron plough, you can't with bronze. So there'd been a lot, an awful lot of clearing. The Neolithics came 5,000 years ago, they were the first farmers, but iron changed everything. Then new ploughing techniques, the early Christian church. Uh, although the early Christian church was, was pantheistic, Pan, the Greek god of nature. It's interesting how English has turned the word Pan into panic. What have we done with the language of the forest? Pan was the god of the forest. And then Rome passed two synods. This is a very troubling fact, two little facts here. It must have been very troubling for early Rome that they were still worshipping or venerating or rituals within forests. Because at the treaty, at the synod, at the Council of Arles, A-R-L-E-S, in 394, the Vatican and the bishops collective condemned as satanic any association with trees of any type at any time they were declared satanic but still the old veneration of trees continued in pockets of the old pagan world the remnants now are the the old trees around the holy wells with the rags. What are those rags? They are prayer flags. They are prayer flags. They are prayer flags. Buddhism didn't invent the prayer flag. It is a collective unconscious practice found in every ancient culture of the planet. The hanging of cloth and 
sent to blow in the wind and carry our aspiration through prayer. So that the last of these ancient holy groves, they're, they're the old hawthorns and oaks and ash trees with the rags of the people. So there was nothing else. We only had rags. But anyway, um, and then there was another council, the Council of Nantes. The Council of Nantes. I was stronger. Lists of men and women frequenting the woods, known to venerate or in any way adore or worship anything in nature, lists to be sent to the local bishops. Anyone you know, you'll get an indulgence for every person you name to the authorities. And that was the act. The Inquisition began. The, dis the burning of men and women. Why was Joan of Arc, what was the first charge against Joan of Arc in the 1400s? Witchcraft. And the basis of that was she was known to spend long times alone under a particular ancient oak tree in France. She must be a witch. Do you understand that? So slowly but surely we became alienated to the point where one of my... Well, he's my friend now, he has grown up. The first time I ever heard him talk was on an outing with his special needs class some years ago. He was a youngster, primary school. He had very little eye contact, no verbal with me, he had never had verbal. And he asked me a question in a forest that we took the class into. And the question was, why are people afraid of trees? He was sending a message from a very profound space. The first time I've ever heard him speak, he asked, why are people afraid of trees? What, what's, wrong with, what's wrong with you? He's asking the question. I don't believe in crystal children. I don't eulogise autism. But um, the, the most autistic adult I would know now, I suppose, he, he would have uh, some obset residual obsessions. And um, he came up with the word to me about, if we're going to talk about biodiversity, you've got to talk about neuro or psychodiversity and make room for people like me. We may be a new archetype of person, we may be a new model of personality. And that's very interesting because I am aware, I've heard of major corporations over the world paying big money to borrow deeply autistic youngsters to solve problems that computers cannot solve. They have a way of seeing things. We have failed the earth ecology. And it may be, I'm not eulogising, I don't believe in that, you are no better. Seamus Heaney's last words, was it? There is nothing beneath me. There is no one beneath me. No consciousness is lesser than mine. So I don't eulogise and say, these are crystal angel children coming to save us. I don't say that, no buts. Their way of thinking may carry the key to remediating the broken nature. It, they may have the key. They're extremely sensitive, the boys and girls I work with, they're very, very sensitive, and they see things you and I would never see. I've experienced that. They see things that I that you'd never think was actually critical to understand or recognise. I mean, every incar we are incarnations, i.e. we are flesh, carnal, incarnal. We have taken a body for a short period of time. We're each having our own complete sovereign experience. We're each having our own experience. Was it Steiner said, there isn't one full moon in his day, there were six and a half billion or six billion. There are six billion full moons. No two humans smile the same. 
are touched by the same subtleties of the planet of the air of the world everyone's in a different experience that is the i look at a birch tree and i'm amazed when i think very high productive alders and birches that produce very high levels of seed have a low level of fertility it's like in northern africa into the middle east female fertility in humans is low hence more than one wife but i've lived in parts of northern assam right up there right up into the north of india where male fertility was low and the woman has more than one husband so the birch tree might produce a half million seeds or this oak tree here might produce 12 full buckets of acorns and there's no two the same by DNA profile or how the shape they take, the crown architecture we call it, there's no two the same. There's no two birch from the same tree the same. Everything is constantly new and yet there's nothing new under the sun. But there's no two beech, there's no clones in nature. Okay, the Irish yew is a clone. The copper beech came from one or two trees in, was it Austria or Germany? And most copper beeches came from a, come from a small few freaks. We call them polyploids. A sudden pigment of brilliant purple out of nowhere. So, so there, there are things like that in nature, perhaps to maybe pre prevent inbreeding, perhaps. That, there's things that we don't understand or know but also we're here to enjoy ourselves and, and to look after the trees and to look after, to leave something for the next, to defend our trees against neglect, disease and vandalism. Really, it's what I think is... Now, I'm looking at this tree and I'm seeing tree ferns, OK? And I'm looking further up the tree, I'm seeing no fungi. I'm seeing no saprophytic fungi. There's nothing here. Telling, this limb snapped in Ophelia. That limb below snapped in Christmas Eve 97. And then this limb up here snapped later. That snapped with Darwin. I've been watching this tree going way, way back. Bit by bit, the tree is shedding its limbs. You can read its battle scars. You can read the body language of this tree. And it's still full of vigour. The more dead wood and dieback you see in an oak's crown, the healthier the tree is. Why is that? Dead wood defends it against our malaria, Malaya and Galilee. Galilee. The, the, the certain pathogenic saprotrophs, sapro-Greek decay, troph feeders, fungi that are searching for food like us. Everything has to have its day. Our belly's full of of trillions of fungi and bacteria and viruses um, and yeasts trying to find their path, their incarnation. Everything's entitled to have its day. I imagine if this is the great wheel of reincarnation, then the earth is important to provide a space for the incarnate to take shape and go back to dust. So um, this, this, uh, this tree will drop its limbs, its dead wood, all the way up the tree, the limbs are coming down, slowly but surely, to protect it from pathogenic or disease-bearing fungi. You know, feeding... When you take away all the dead wood from a tree, you're opening the tree to deadly fungi. Leave the dead wood, the die back. When you're looking up at an oak tree or any tree and you see a lot of dead wooden dieback, that's the crown readjusting itself. This tree, I, I got permission from the owner, Mortimer Toomey, his mother, Ellen, allowed me cut this limb here years and years ago. But such is the density of the rings, again indicative of indigenous wildwood, of, wild, of, of old DNA. The denser the rings, the more Aboriginal is the oak. We know that from research in Belvoir Estate outside Belfast. Published research. They've researched, researched. The, nat the true native oaks are, are very densely. Real hardwood. Very dense. The European oaks are softwoods. A lot of them are quite softwood. Well, semi-softwood. 
semi-hard ones you could say. But I, on this, what I could read, and I could only read half the ring, because the outer half had rotted. This was so rotted on the outside, and impossible to read the heartwood. The heartwood had turned to ebony. What I could read, I got 430 rings. I believe there are a lot more years in this tree. I could only get 430. And I think the average was, was even more than 430. So this tree was already no teenager in the time of Cromwell. This tree saw, goes, goes right back. And if this was some class of an inaugural tree, because we call it the Muscree Oak, Muscree is a barony, this was the seat of the Norman Baron, Dermot Moore, first Viscount, Lord Baron Muscree. And, and, and why is this tree being preserved? Pen didn't touch it. The hedges didn't touch it. None of the new incoming Protestant loyalists disturbed the woodlands of this estate because that was the culture. So to quote Ridge, he said on the walk, I was marking a hundred years since the 1923 Land Act, when the new government seized three million acres of estates and domains and began the Holocaust of trees. Another story. Ridge said, at least the Brits left, left you at least the Brits left Ireland some of Europe's finest parks. And indeed they did. Some of Europe's finest domains and parks still exist. According to the latest survey, there are 6,000 designed landscape still on the island. There's nearly 1,000 in County Cork of designed, partly walled remnant landscapes. Most of Ireland's golf courses come from the 1923 Act. A golf course constituted a tenant. The 1923 Act seized all untenanted land within the estates. Now, by 1871, there were 700 families owned half of Ireland's 32,000 square miles. By 1871, just 700 families with estates over 5,000 acres owned half of the 32,000 uh, square miles. In the same year, in the same year, there, were, there was no fixity of tenure, there was no fairness of rent, and there was no free, the three Fs that Parnell and Michael Davitt brought in in 1879. The country had been reduced to violence. Every week a landlord was being murdered, or a land agent, or a middleman. Because I said earlier, the farms were getting smaller and smaller. 30 acre was the average. 30 pounds a year leaving the country for their clubs in London and New Delhi and Beirut coming between six and nine million pounds. The country's blood was bleeding out of the country. And the farms, very few farms were bigger than 30 acre. Then there was the Church of Ireland tithes, the tithes was five shillings an acre. Catholic or Protestant, you paid your local rector or Protestant church five shillings an acre for potatoes and five shillings an acre for hay. The tithes were down to your last square metre of land of its use and there was a price put on it. The people were demented. No wonder they were up in arms. They were arming now at this stage, they were arming. Michael Davitt declared in 1879 when he founded the, the Land League, he was tacitly supported by the leader of the Irish party who, who held the balance of power in the House of Commons. The Liberals and the Whigs got choked with one another and the Irish party held the balance. And Parnell said, Gladstone, Gladstone Prime Minister, what will you give us? He said, I'll give you a land act. I'll give you fair rent. I'll give you fixed tenure. Irish tenants were tenants at will. There was no... You were out on the whim or will of the Lord. Do you understand that? You were a tenant at will. Any whiff of sedition or popery or democracy, Christ, you were out on your ear. 
any whiff. And remember, elections were in public. And who was in charge of the elections? Your local landlord. So you always return to your local landlord, who was almost, well, who was nearly always deeply bigoted, bitter, and hateful of the indigenous peoples. But he, he was in charge of the elections. The courts, the courts of justice, were in the hands of the landlords. There was nowhere to go. So David said, as and from today, no rent. By God, that woke up the landlords. Their stream of free money pouring in to the American clubs and wherever there was Masonic clubs across Delhi. I lived around Delhi for over a year. Wherever these landlords... The absentees were sucking the country dry. Suddenly there's no rent coming in. The middleman and land agent doesn't have his, his fatted goose for dinner. There's nothing coming in. And then David said, and then boycott. Boycott means don't talk to that class. Don't serve them in any shop. Withdraw all the servants from their big houses. Pull out all the milkmen. And Fota Island had over 70 workers. Fota Island was a good story. They were allowed to keep their entire estate of 1,000 acres because they could prove under the 1923 Act that they were huge employers and that they worked the land good and well. Inspectors were sent around the estates to decide whether certain estates should be left alone or seized. But in any event, to go back to David, the boycott, you couldn't get you couldn't get food from the mill for your whore. You'd get nothing. The gunsmiths would, couldn't, wouldn't maintain your guns. There was no one there to gilly with you. There was no one there to go hunting and looking after your guns when you were on your weekly shoot or weekly hunt. Hunting was central to the, pop, to the uh, propter decorum of that class. In fact, they say Massey hunted seven days a week. Hedges only hunted five days a week. He hunted seven days a week, including the Sabbath, which was a real big thing to the Calvinist community of the time. And then Gladstone said, Do you know, I'll kill, quote, I'll kill home rule with kindness. I'll go further. I'll help Catholic tenants buy their own land and acquire the freehold from the estates. We'll set up a fund to help them buy their land. Well, first of all, the landlords couldn't believe that any part of empire would be given over to indigenous Catholics. Couldn't stand the idea. But there were bonuses of 12%. The land was valued 15 to 20 times what the land commission that was created under the Land Act of 1881 to Parnell's specifications by... You see, the Crown forces had lost control of Ireland under David and Parnell. The landlords were starving. There was nothing on their shelves. The, the castle staff had abandoned them. Boycott meant boycott. Not like today that we're playing with Putin and we're supposed to be sanctioning, but he's still not hungry. Someone's giving him food. Someone's playing ball with Putin. But under David, and I'll give you a description that was published that year, every human became one vast machine that answered to a man every order from David, who was now in prison, of course, in solitary confinement, but his directions were getting out to the tenants. Hundreds of thousands of tiny tenants. The average 30, we are down to five and six acres. You're down to... The gavel kind system still hadn't gone. It was relieved, but it still hadn't gone. If you had ten children, you broke your 30 acre into ten units. There were still re re elements of that in the people, which meant that we had congested districts. Whole areas were choked with communities, with 
choked with insufficient land to feed themselves. So, bit by bit, slowly but surely, then there was another land act of, there was five land acts in the 1880s, 1890s. 1903, the, uh, the Wyndham Act of, of 1903. And it was in Muskery, it's when Muskery began to get the freehold under the Wyndham or the Ashburn Act. The 1903 Land Act is the beginning of the breaking up of the estates in the mountains, the remoter estates. Kilmichael, Inchigila, Clondrod, the really remote, possibly up to 100 estates. Small estates of 60 townlands or 30 townlands, not the big estates of 700,000 acres belonging to the Lord's Bantry. And uh, Lady Juliet Fitzwilliam, daughter of the 23rd Earl Fitzwilliam, 56,000 acre estate in South Wicklow. Ballyseedy was a big battle to stop the big bypass going through the middle of Ballyseedy Wood outside of Tralee. Balia Sheada, the place of the fairies. And it's a fairy oak wood. Oh my God, there are fairies there. I often camped up there. Oh, there's movements and sounds and lights and you wouldn't know where you are but you wouldn't be scared because you wouldn't be scared in the forest I mean when I was in Mont, Mont Saint Michel and I did spent the summer just visiting the cathedrals of the 11th century Europe the cathedrals are forests those pillars are trees St Francis was asked isn't it time, St. Francis, that you built your cathedral and set up? Your... He said, never, never. My church is the forest, not a building. My church is the forest. So um, next time you're in a church, look again at this arched forest, which inspired the first cathedrals. And the upper, what we call fenestration, the upper stained glass, not the lower stained glass, the upper stained glass was the filtering of light down into the forest floor. The oldest beach avenue, the oldest avenue I know in County Cork is in this domain. It's the double rank. It's probably from the late 1700s. It is the most, 90% of it's lost with time. And with mismanagement, the town's water pipes they dug down the middle of the avenue, a pit twice the width of that, very, very deep, tore up the roots of the entire avenue for almost a third of a kilometre and laid down the new pipes. In 1991, the environmental group were up in arms. We begged them to choose some other route, but they didn't understand. And following that, they just crumped, they rotted. Their roots rotted. They just kept falling. So there's about, out of 150 beach, I reckon there's about less than 25 beach left. We reckon, Connor and I reckon, there was 75 beach in each, in each aisle. It's called the double rank because there's, two, there's, there's three aisles. There's the main beach avenue and two side aisles flanked by large-leaved lime. That and the distance between the outer pillars, the limes, and the distance between the inner pillars, precisely Notre Dame, hmm. to the centimetre. So there was always something Masonic going on in, in the design of these designed landscapes. So I want to just finish now on a small poem. There once was a seed who just didn't want to grow and he stayed in the earth deep down below and when the rain came knocking on his door saying come out to play he just curled up once more and said go away his brothers and sisters were growing up fast they said hey brother come on or you'll be the last we can dance in the wind and sing in the rain but their brother replied leave me alone i can't handle wind and rain but still they insisted come brother grow and we stand close together. When the winter winds blow. 
So he pushed himself up with all of his might into this air, into this light. And now he dances, now he dances gracious and free. No longer a seed, but a beautiful tree. I want to just sort of finish on that, if that's okay. Because that's a story. We're, we're all that little seed. And, uh, and we all need support. Each one of us need that inspiration. Truly, we need each other's support. Because these are, these, these are hard days for the spirit. These are hard days. They're not easy days for anything. I wanted to acknowledge the people that have coloured my thinking and supported me in my journey. This question, oh Ted, when did you wake up and become an environmentalist? It's not like that. An angel doesn't whisper in one's ear. Or uh, as Aldo Leopold says, you will pay a price if you become environmentally conscious and that price is to live alone in a world full of wounds. And he goes on to say, the vast bulk of humanity, to them, the wounded earth, the trees, the animals, the rivers, the mountains, with, with all of their shot bears and shot wolves, with their extinct species, it's invisible to 99% of humanity. It's only that small percentage that can see that hedgerow vandalised in the during May when the birds are nesting. But in any event, I wanted to I wanted to say thank you. My hero at the moment, and have for many years, is Tony Lowes. He lives in Kilcastron and Allies. He's a member, founding member, and I think he's chair of uh, Friends of the Irish Environment. He would be old. He would be my senior at every level. He's a very good man, trying to arouse consciousness. I'm very interested in fungi, particularly honey fungus, Armillaria malaya, also known as bootlace fungus. I had a whole series of correspondence with then chairperson or chief executive of the National Botanic Gardens, Aidan Brady, and Aidan taught me so much. And Aidan Brady passed over, he's gone... He's gone, away, he's gone away from us. So I wanted to thank Aidan. I also wanted to thank the living taxonomist, Dr Charles Nelson, who for many years has written and answered every one of my letters on sometimes complex issues of taxonomy, of why a certain, why a certain plant is classified in a certain species and not in another. I wanted to thank Charles Nelson I also want to thank Diana Burthwood Kroger. Whenever she's in Ireland, she meets me over the years and we have great times. And then I want to thank a very special person who's helped me for many years, Professor Daniel Kelly in Trinity College. He's a woodland botanist. Then I want to thank John D. McNamara. I want to thank Frances Astor. Her mother was Nancy Astor first female MP in the House of Commons. I also wanted to thank Bernadette Connolly, Bernie Connolly. She's Secretary of the Cork Environmental Forum. I also want to thank the first Heritage Council chairperson was Frida Rowntree. I knew Frida well, 1996. Frida was an absolutely gorgeous person. She passed suddenly, shockingly, as a young woman. She had the energy to, to get the government to give the state a heritage council with an independent status and an ability to criticise and question government decisions. She won that from the state.